this is the Redmi Note 7 Pro and I've been using it since the day it came out because I got it on the first day itself thanks to Ranjay for helping me out with an F code so I didn't have to stand in lines and wait in queues or even participate in flash sale which was really convenient but since this is a pro version of the Note 7 this has almost throughout slightly upgraded hardware internally like uh, you know, better processor, more RAM, more storage, but most importantly, the camera. This has a 48 megapixel camera, and that's what this video is all about. Now, whenever there is a different kind of an approach towards any specific hardware in any phone or any device, uh, there's basically two things to talk about. First is the theory, and second is the actual practical usage. So to begin with the theoretical aspect, the size of the image sensor, which is basically the brain of the camera, is directly proportional to the quality of the image. Uh, the bigger the image sensor, the better the quality of the image. The Note 7 Pro has a Sony IMX586 sensor, and it is a bigger sensor because, at least when compared to the Note 7, because both the Note 7 Pro and the Note 7 are equally thick. Pretty thick at about 8 millimeters, but the camera bump, the camera actually sticks out way more in the Note 7 Pro, which clearly says it has a bigger camera. But even though it's a bigger camera, it's still pretty small because after all it's made for a phone. So when 48 megapixels, meaning 48 million pixels are fitted in such a tiny sensor, the size of each pixel reduces by about four times uh, when compared to the size of the pixel in a similarly sized 12 megapixel sensor. This does not allow a lot of light to enter. That's why HTC in 2013 reduced the megapixel count to just four megapixels in the camera of HTC One. And that's why Sony reduced the megapixel count to just 12 megapixels in the A7S II for better low light photography. But since the IMX586 is a 48 megapixel sensor, for more light to enter, it has the pixels arranged in a slightly different manner. It actually combines and creates a group of four adjacent similar pixels to act as one giant pixel. This, even though it reduces the resolution to 12 megapixels, in theory, the images turn out to be way better in low light. This whole process of four pixels becoming one giant pixel is known as pixel binding or pixel binning. So my guess is that when since this always shoots in 12 megapixels in the default standard mode, this has pixel binding always turned on. And when you switch to the 48 megapixel mode, this disables the pixel binding for all the pixels to unleash for those high resolution shots. But this is all theoretical. Does it actually do that? Does it actually, is there any difference? Very tiny one. Like these are two similar images captured in 12 megapixel and 48 megapixels respectively. And upon zooming in, there is just a slight difference that you can notice in terms of the details retained. Here's another shot captured in the day. And upon zooming all the way in, there is a slight difference in the clock as the 48 megapixel image retains us just a tiny bit more detail. This third shot is captured in low light and this time upon zooming in, the 48 megapixel image actually shows more noise compared to the 12 megapixel one, but barely any more detail, which actually just proves the theory. So even though 48 megapixel is four times 12 megapixel, the details and the difference is surely not four times better. Plus the picture taking experience in the 48 megapixel mode is a bit disappointing. Firstly, even though the difference is barely noticeable, the 48 megapixel images are very heavy in size, almost double. Secondly, you cannot use HDR or AI controls or shoot videos or even take portrait images in 48 megapixel. Lastly, it's just not very convenient because it takes a good chunk of time for the images to process and while they process, the camera app is almost unresponsive. For me, once it actually stopped working, so I literally had to reboot the phone to get it to work. The only plus point that I saw in taking 48 megapixel shots over the 12 megapixel ones is that you get to zoom in much more on the phone to actually a crazy length. But apart from that, 
the massive delay in processing and not much difference don't really make it appealing. Although it doesn't take away from the fact that the camera performance in general is really impressive, with really good details in even in 12 megapixel. If you know about angles, framing, or even have a basic knowledge of photography, you can capture some terrific shots from this camera. And if you don't, you can simply join a short course on the web itself on Skillshare, which although is pretty affordable at about less than $10 a month, but with the link in the description, the first 500 of you can join for the first two months completely free. There are hundreds and thousands of classes to choose from to develop a skill set, and all of these classes are to the point and just a couple of minutes long, like this photography one from Joe, which I'll actually recommend you to start up with. Make sure to check it out, I'll leave it linked below. But talking about the camera performance, I think it has been pretty consistent in creating really balanced and great looking shots. I was really impressed by the dynamic range especially. Like in this shot, the sky is not blown out and the underside of the flyover is not completely dark. And this was shot in 48 megapixels. The balance between the shadows and the highlights is almost always really soothing to the eyes. Now, the saturation and the contrast are subjective and can be edited but straight out of the camera. It is not too harsh and not too dull as the iPhone, so it's pretty balanced and I like it. The shots in low light definitely take a hit. There is, if you zoom in, a good amount of noise and a lack of detail, even in 48 megapixel shots. It does have a night mode built in, but I would highly recommend not using it because it's really good at being bad and yielding terrible results. But then there is video. Now this can finally shoot in 4K at 30 frames per second and it does have software based stabilization. No OIS which is hardware based but that's okay because the video part actually came as a surprise. It not only is really crisp but the colors are also really appealing to the eyes. It's almost as if it's already shooting in a pre-applied LUT or a color grade. But lastly there is that front facing camera neatly placed in that notch. Now, if you have been following the channel, you would be knowing that I just cannot take selfies. But in this case, actually just kidding, this was also not an exception. So that is pretty much it. That's the camera of the Redmi Note 7 Pro. Apart from 48 megapixel, it's actually a really capable camera, really fascinating images, very appealing video, and overall easily the best bang for the buck. Stick around for the full review, and I'll talk to you in the next one. Take care.